Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today uh, via Zoom and welcome to our pigment making workshop. This workshop is part of Concordia's See You at Home initiative, a university wide effort to bring you programming that keeps you active, in touch, and engaged during this time. Uh, my name is Chloe. I work at Fourth Space. And today we'll be going to get we're going to get reacquainted with our creative side, um, much needed during these times, I think. We'll be using um, compostable food waste, specifically blueberries, to make our own natural dyes, which can be used to color clothing or as a drying medium. Uh, we hope this workshop will be as interactive our, as our technology allows us, so please feel free to ask questions throughout the workshop, either using the Q&A feature in Zoom or uh, I, if you're watching on Facebook by writing a question in the comments on this video. Uh, I will get your questions to our workshop facilitator throughout. And on that note, I want to in introduce my friend, uh, Lisa Izohov, our workshop facilitator today. Uh, Lisa is just graduating from Studio Arts and has also recently launched the Unicorn Factory, an online space for artists and their studios, shining light on the processes, rituals, and messes. Uh, Lisa's drawing practice is based on observation and repetition. She works mainly with pencil crayons on paper, but recently began experimenting with collage and creating natural pigments. Hello, Lisa. On behalf of Fourth Space and our viewers, we are so grateful to have you here. I'm very excited to finally take the time take the time to make my own dyes, something that I myself have been striving towards recently, adding to Concordia's material culture of care and sustainable art practices. Um, this workshop was actually inspired by one Lisa and I had intended on doing in, collab in collaboration with SACR, uh, Concordia University Center for Creative Reuse, um, as a part of their annual artist residency. Uh, so with that, welcome Lisa, let's get dying. Hello everybody and welcome to our kitchen here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I hope you brought all your stuff. Um, so as Chloe said, I'm graduating from Concordia this summer um, within the studio program and uh, in the last couple months I've been experimenting with creating my own pigments and my own um, watercolors and stuff like that. And my latest obsession is creating inks with blueberries, uh, which can also be used as watercolors basically. So for our workshop today, what you need to have is two cups of blueberries. They can be either fresh or uh, frozen, so it doesn't really matter. Um, one tablespoon of vinegar, doesn't matter which vinegar, it just uh, acts as a preservative. And just a pinch of salt. And for different like variation of the color, which I'll talk about a bit later, either a lemon or baking soda would be really fun to use. And without further ado, let's get this started. So basically what you do, also, sorry, before we go any further, please make sure that the pot that you're using is a pot that's only going to be used for ink making um, and not for cooking or making any other stuff because you don't want to contaminate your food since you are going to be using vinegar and all the natural stuff that comes up from the blueberries themselves. I usually put it just on medium because you don't want it to like cook too quickly and you want to make sure that everything is being released. Um, also designate a fork for your ink making um, and let it get started to kind of keep it boiling and everything start to kind of push it around to make sure that all the defrosted ones will shed their extra water. Um, and as we go along, it will take about five minutes for it to bring to a boil. Um, we'll start mashing them up to really release all the juices that we have in there. Um, Lisa, I'm going to pipe in with a question we have here from a viewer. Um, are all of these ingredients are kitchen foods? Um, somebody's okay with using a saucepan for this if it's the only dyeing that they're going to be able to do. Is that okay? Oh yeah, as long as you kind of designate it, it doesn't really matter um, what what you use, like a pot or a saucepan or whatever whatever you're comfortable with. I just this is my tiny little dye, and I use it for all my ink making and dyes. Um, that's the designated one. As long as you just don't use it with other, like your regular cooking stuff, it's all good. Okay, so as long as we give it like a good wash after, we should be good yeah. to go. Yeah. Um, and uh, somebody else is asking how much water we, we should add. 
So just to basically cover them, because we're using two cups of blueberries, then about like until it reaches the surface of the blueberry cream puff. We don't have to like overfill it or anything like that. Great. Just start pushing them around. You'll see that they're already releasing some of the color and some of the pigment. Um, but the moment it will bring up to boil, we'll be able to mask them out and really make them pop with color. Um, usually for different, if you don't have all blueberries or anything like that, you can switch to blackberries as well, because um, blackberries are pretty cool. Um, and they also release a really deep color. So if you wanted to kind of vary what you're using in your ink making, I think Blackberries would be kind of cool to use with the blueberries or on and on. Um, the process is pretty similar. We're going to do this for just 20 minutes. You don't really need to do it any longer unless you want the color a lot deeper, but 20 minutes is more than enough for it. And so Lisa, does the temperature of the water need to be at a specific, um, does it need to be a specific heat at a specific temperature? Uh, no, just to bring it to a boil and then we're going to lower it down to like number two or number three or something like that. That's more than enough. And are you only boiling blueberries and water? That's it in your pot, just blueberries yeah. and water? Today is just the blueberries. Um, I do have some blackberries that maybe I will try next. Um, it's just it's fun to see kind of what color will come out of with which result. Any additional questions? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so it's getting heated up. It's pretty good right now. You can start by mashing them. Just use the back of the fork itself and start mashing them around just so they will release the complete pigment. Um, I completely start, uh, forgot to put a timer, so <laughs> don't, don't repeat my mistake. Just put it for 20 minutes. There we go. Holding. And that will be more than enough. 11. We're at 11.38. We probably started about two minutes ago, so it'll be very good. We'll probably do it about noon, uh, up until noon. Sorry, this is Manitoba time. I'm so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you guys have 12.38. My time is 11.38, so we'll do it until 1, and that'll be more than enough for it. And you smash it around, move it around, and you can kind of leave it alone right now. It's not going to do anything more than just boil it up. Yeah. Um, Lisa, uh, have you used other berries or plants? And do you think this technique can be used with vegetables like beets or cabbage? Yes. So beets are really fun. They will release it to a little bit lighter purple um, going towards the pink shade. And basically you use the same method. So you kind of cut them up um, with the skins. The skins are very important actually because they have most of the pigment in there. Um, you cut them up to little cubes, you can use up to four or five of them, depends on the size of the pot and how much ink you actually want to make, since it just depends on the amount of water that you're putting into your pot, and that's basically the amount you will have in your jar. Um, and about 20 minutes, and that's it. Um, so how much ink does of water make? Um, so I'll show you what I made last time. Um, so this is my one that I made in the beginning of April. I don't know if you can really see it. So I divided it already into two different shades as well. So it only came up till here. And how many cups of water was that? This was two cups of water. Okay. It was like up to here and then I divided it up. I'll show you later with different um, pH variations. Um, and for cabbage as well, purple cabbage will also be like a little bit of a lighter purple, lighter bluish. Also about 20 minutes will be more than enough. So mine is already in a boil. I'm just going to lower it down and mash it another time to make sure that we're releasing everything out. And another cool one that I've made um, was with onion skins. I made an onion skin um, dye and an ink. And that takes about four hours. And I've actually collected the onion skins for about a month. So I had a huge bag of onion skins. Um, I use just yellow ones, but you can use purple ones as well. And they kind of release the same amount of color. And you do that for four hours and you just kind of mash them around 
cover them with water as well. And every couple of minutes, like 20 minutes or so, you're just gonna come and you're gonna swirl them up, uh, swirl them a little bit. And that's basically it. And after four hours, it's ready. And it will be more condensed um, since you're vaporizing the water a lot longer. Um, so it will create like a smaller jar of that. Um, so how color fast are these dyes that we're making? So um, I would recommend to wait about 24 hours before using them just because they need to settle down because they're just like so warm and everything and they're kind of so crazy and they're like, what is going on here? Um, but we're boiled. Um, so you want to... Wait, I think your audio cut out. hours to sit, rest, let them kind of be. Um, and because also the color takes time to oxidize and you want to make sure that it will oxidize well completely and then Sorry, Lisa. And then what you audio cut out again? using like an empty jam jar. Um, um, if you have others, if you want to play with pH, which is really fine, I really do recommend it. Um, get like smaller jars for you to work with. And uh, one of the pH variations we can use is lemon juice. So with lemon juice, um, the blueberry color will be very nice and bright. It will be very pink. And it depends how much of the lemon you're going to be squeezing. And the other pH variation that you can be used um, is with baking soda. So I kind of overkilled mine <laughs> and it, cause I dumped it and I didn't think it would come up in a clump. Um, I would recommend to just use like, uh, maybe half of a teaspoon is more than enough and you kind of mix it all together. And again, let it sit down a little bit and it will be a really nice variation. Um, actually, if you want, can you, can we switch the camera to the drying ones and I'll show you the variations right now. Cool, okay. So here we are at my station. So this is the one that I use my blueberry with lemon. So for example, this is a lot brighter than the regular ink. So this is the regular ink, the blueberry one. So right now they kind of look the same, but if we give them some time to to dry, it'll be really fun and you'll see the difference in between them. And this one, I just added the baking soda. So this will be, it looks black right now, but when it dries out, it will be light blue. Um, Lisa, do the dyes smell of the fruit or vegetable from which they're made afterwards? Yes. Do, they do? The Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so do the dyes smell of the fruit or vegetable afterwards? Is it very vinegary? What does it smell like? It smells like blueberries. It's amazing. It's just blueberries. The onion skin one will smell, <laughs> it will stink like onions. <laughs> um, so be prepared for that, but it doesn't smell too vinegary whatsoever. It's just a mordant, so it kind of like clumps it together like the pigment itself. Um, so it won't just like be water, you know, so it won't be just blueberry water. The vinegar and the salt kind of keep it together as an ink form. Do the dyes separate in, in their little pots? So how long, are, how long would they be good for? So, um, so far I had, I made mine in the beginning of April and they're still good. And, um, I've heard that about up to six months, they'll be fine if they're kept like in a cool place. Um, yeah, it's about and three to six months is good. And I know that you've been experimenting with um, dyeing your own clothing and embroidery. Um, have you ever used this recipe to dye clothing or is this recipe more one geared towards um, watercolor? So 
So I used this recipe, the onion skin, I used to dye some fabric. I dyed some cotton um, and I braided it into a little um, wall hanging. Sorry, mm -hmm. I A tapestry, I guess. I think um, I think Lisa's frozen. Um, just waiting a little bit for that. Is you've been boiling, of course. So if you've been boiling, for example, the fabric for four hours, like the ink for four hours, then the fabric will come along and be there for four hours as well. So you can either start dyeing it all together, but I would recommend to separate those so you'll have a mixture ready and it's already like saturated with color and everything like that. And then you put the fabric in and you let it sit there with all the juices. So it's a lot better. And with the inks, I already, I use the blueberries as well to dye fabric. And it also just takes like 40 minutes and it's cool. Um, we have a couple new uh, attendees, Lisa. Um, can you go over the recipe and the quantity of water, vinegar we should be using? Um, and whether or not we've started to add um, these little extra things like vinegar, salt. We'll come along a little bit more at the end. So, so far, what we've done, we took our designated pot, we put our two cups of fresh blueberries or, or frozen ones, it's okay, nonetheless. And we covered them with water, just enough to cover them. You don't need to be like overflowing the pot itself. And you let it come to a boil um, for about 20 minutes. And then you lower it down after it comes to boil, so like number two or number three on your, on your stove. Um, so we are about 13 minutes away, maybe a little bit less. Yeah, it's a bit less. So about 10 minutes away from it being done. Um, and just keep mashing it, keep swerving it. So after it comes to a boil, smash it. So release all the pigment. And in about five minutes, we'll be able to put the vinegar. So you only need one tablespoon about of what of vinegar. It doesn't really matter. It could be apple cider vinegar, it can be white wine vinegar, whatever you have at home, and just a pinch of salt. Um, we have a uh, attendee here that would love to hear more about uh, your experience fabric uh, dyeing fabric. Um, did you just boil the fabric with the pigment, or did you dip the fabric into the pigment? Um, so I tried two separate ways to see what will make it better. The first one was just to dump the fabric with the onion skins before the pigment was made. Um, and I, I saw that the color is a bit lighter, no matter how long I kept it in there. Um, so I would recommend to make the dye first. So it does take four hours. For example, I did an onion skin one and it takes four hours for the, ink, takes, takes for, the for the pigment to be made. And um, I left it there overnight. And then the next day I came back with my washed and um, uh, wetted fabric and I put it in the pot and then I reseeped it for four hours. And then the color was amazing. Okay, so just to recap you, so you made the dye, the next day you come back with your white or your just natural colored cloth that is wet. And then you put it back into the dye that you were re-simmering on the stove and let that sit for a while. Cool. For about two or four hours, depends how deep the, you want the color to be. We have a fun question here. Have you ever used a crock pot or do you think a crock pot could be used for this kind of um, dye making? Uh, it's a good question. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't, I actually have not tried. I have the designated pot, like I have the small one for just the watercolors and ink. And then when I lived in Montreal, I had a big guy that I used for my fabric. Um, I guess you can try, but again, it just needs to be designated or very well washed. Okay. Um, Arian Weeks from Sucker here also says that he thinks that using a crock pot would work. Um, <laughs> Arian just wants to know um, what kind of dye uh, you can get from flowers. I don't know if you've tried that out. Um, my next project will be flower bundle dyeing. I don't know if uh, it's, um, there's a few books that I will send an email to you for space afterwards, Ari. Um, with some links and everything. There's a few books that talk about that. And um, there's a few videos and a few Instagram artists um, that are doing exactly this thing. So basically what bundle dyeing is, is you collect some flowers from whatever colors you want and you put them on your fabric, just lay it all out. 
and you put the flowers where you want them to be, you either hammer them down um, or you just leave them like that. It really depends on your preferences. And then you uh, start rolling them in and then you roll them either into like a coil shape or you just leave it like that and you put some, uh, you tie it around and then you simmer it in water. So this is just, you, you don't want to dye the fabric itself, but you want the flower itself. Um, but that's just bundle dyeing. And if you're trying to dye with flowers, just flowers as a fabric dye itself, um, I haven't tried that. I think marigold will be very nice. Marigold will do like a really nice yellow, goldish color. Um, what other flowers can you use? I saw somebody doing it with artichokes. It's a ton of flower, but like artichokes uh, do like a really nice green color. So I think that would be kind of cool to try as well. There's so many fruits and veggies that like release different pigments and it's a whole world. Have you ever tried um, tea leaves? Yeah, I tried some uh, green tea leaves and I tried black tea leaves. Um, they're kind of brownish, they're not very interesting. Uh, coffee, also just kind of like brownish, darkish. But Um, do you think this would work, um, all of these colors, any kind of natural dye would work as a very temporary hair dye? So, uh, Lisa, can you move towards your uh, sketchbook camera? We think the audio might be a bit better there. Oh, okay. Never mind. Okay. All good? Yeah, it's a little better. Um, so uh, the question that cut out before was, um, so we were talking about tea leaves and they, tea leaves and coffee having like a kind of brownish tint. And um, yeah, using natural dyes uh, is a very temporary hair dye. Do you have any thoughts on that? I know you recently dyed your hair pink. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I've seen what happens to my wall hanging after dyeing it with uh, blueberries and onion skins, yes, it's very temporary, unfortunately. Um, one of the things that you can do to kind of keep it from fading away is putting a little bit more vinegar or gum arabic if it's in the liquid form, so it will kind of contain the color itself. I haven't tried that yet. That's a different method all completely, so it's something to explore. Um, but also it's really kind of, it's so fun because like it's just like buying linen clothes. If you buy like a black linen, it will fade away of the color, but it's still pretty and nice. So like, why not try that? Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever tried using cherries in, in dye? Not yet. I also just want to uh, get fresh cherries because they will, um, I don't know, I just want to try it with fresh. Like the frozen ones are fine. Um, but I think with fresh cherries, if you go and hand pick them, it's like it's such a great experience, you know. So hopefully when quarantine is done, I'll go pick some cherries and try it out. Yeah, I, I think cherries are really interesting because um, you can get them in so many different forms. You can get maraschino cherries that are like in their own sugar. And that's like so pigmented. If you ever got like a maraschino cherry fell on your white blouse, that's it. There's, um, but frozen cherries seem to have um, like all of the juice is just sucked out of it. So I don't think too much uh, to use there. So I think um, the idea for using cherries would have to be using fresh, juicy cherries. Exactly. Cut up and squished up. Yeah, I agree. So we're about five minutes from done. So now you can use your one tablespoon of white vinegar or whatever vinegar you have at home, just dump it in. Um, and just a pinch of salt. Uh, and how long do you keep the dyes? Like we said a bit before, so six, um, six weeks or six months that we can keep the dyes? Six months. And would that be in the refrigerator? Um, I kind of keep them just away from the sun. So I have like a little art trolley that's in the shade and I just leave it there and it's fine. Um, what happens if they are in direct sunlight? Um, they kind of lose a bit of their color and that's it. Okay. Yeah. It's not, it's not that terrible. No, no, it's not. It definitely adds for a different uh, variety and color shades. Yeah, exactly. So it's already, if you started um, with us, so it's already starting to kind of really have a really deep, nice color. Let's see if I can just get a little bit and show it to the camera. So, 
So the peels in there, those are the blueberry skins, right? What does the, what do the contents of your pot look like? Oh, um, okay, let's do it like this. Can we switch the camera? <laughs> oh, so that's a little lumpy. It's kind of pinkish. Yeah. Um, so the sieve afterwards, you would use um, you you would pour it through a sieve and to take out all of the skin. Yeah. Yeah. I here. Can we switch the camera back? Awesome. So basically, uh, yeah, you just use the sieve to get rid of all like the clumps and the peas and the skins and everything. This one is not really fine. So this is will be just like step one. And if you have like a finer one, then use this guy, that's fine. But I just have this guy only. So I'll basically just sift twice to make sure that all the grain is gone. But at the same time, the grain is really nice because it just adds like a little bit more texture to it and I don't really mind it. So it's not the worst thing in the world if our dye um, that we use for watercolor paintings is kind of lumpy. No, mm -hmm. it's all good. It's fun. Do you think it would create like a kind of uh, resist effect as it would with usual watercolor with if you were to add like a salt to it? Is it the same kind of idea? Oh. Um, I haven't tried that, but I don't know, maybe these guys, they have a little bit of residue. So when we will uh, draw with the pigments a little bit with the ones that are already pre-made, I'll show you what it has. It does have a little bit of a residue and it does have a little bit of those grains. I didn't try remove them or anything like that. But also you can use a little pH, like two different to differentiate the colors. As I said before, you can use either lemon or baking soda or any other pH like stuff. I don't actually know what other stuff, but I've just been using baking soda and lemon and it changes the color. So you can like spot it a little bit and splash it in your drawings and it will change color. That's very cool. I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, try these out. Um, before you were talking about adding a uh, gum arabic to uh, pigments to, what does that do? So it also acts as a mordant. So it just concentrates the color together so it won't break apart to just like water. So, because this is basically right now. Oh, you're cut out again. Also, I've been experimenting with um, pigments from the earth. So I brought some uh, really colorful rocks, really cool rocks from Israel, from my, from my homeland. Um, and I broke them down with like a brick and mortar, like, yeah, brick and mortar, I guess it's called it. Mortar and pastel, sorry. <laughs> mortar and pastel. And you break them down really finely and you grind them out and you dump them onto a glass little thingy and you mold them further to make sure that they're really fine. And what the gum arabic do, if you want to create like a watercolor, for example, the gum arabic will bring it all together into a clump and then you can put it in a specific container. And after 24 hours, it will harden and then you can use it as a watercolor. Okay, so it'll harden kind of um, just like usual dry pigment uh, water. Exactly. Okay. Um, and if you were to make, does, it, does the consistency of the um, gum arabic need to be a specific way in order to become that kind of solid? I have um, crystallized um, arabic gum. Does that, does that differ from anything that would be, say, jelly or, or liquid? Not really, because if you just have the crystallized version, you just need to boil it, right? So it will come to a consistency that's watery, so you can mix the pigment within it. Um, and usually also just depends on the amount of pigment that you have on your palette. So if you have, for example, usually I just use like a teaspoon or two teaspoons of powder of like the pigment itself. And then I make like a little well, just like when you're making focaccia or anything else for pasta, you make a little well and you put a little bit of the gum arabic and you use your palette knife to bring it all together. And if you find it's too runny or it's too, or it is still too thick, then you can just add whatever you need. And um, what can you use um, the watercolors on? Like, is there, if you add gum arabic to it, is that still okay for working on regular pieces of paper? Or would you suggest a different paper surface for that? Um, 
Um, I've been using watercolor paper on it, but right now I don't have any access to it since we're confined to our home. So I have just my regular sketchbook. You can use printer paper, whatever sketchbook you have laying around. If you have Bristol paper or like construction paper, it's really fun too. Uh, yeah, kind of free flow, just do whatever you want. It's gonna be fun, it's just experimenting, right? Um, let's move to your sketchbook now. Um, uh, we, we've been, it's done. <laughs> oh, it's done? So, okay. It's done. Um, so it's been 20 minutes. So just remove it from the heat. Let's let it sit for a little bit because sifting through it and putting the jar while it's really hot. I don't want you to injure yourself or burn your hand. So let it, let's let it sit for a little bit and then let's move to the sketchbook. Yeah. Yay. Okay, cool. So as you can see, this is the one that we used was lemon. This is the regular dye. And this one is with baking soda. So it's a bit darker than what I expected, but um, I guess you can just play with the consistency of the baking powder. So like however much you put in here. I would recommend to label them because it does help. Um, we use baking soda. Or is it okay? Okay, it's okay now. Cool. I just want to be able to see. Even though <laughs> it's gonna show it's not good. Um, so these are IKEA brushes, to be completely honest with you. And I love them. They're big, they're nice, they're poofy. And here is the consistency of the blueberry ink without any additives. So I think it looks very, very nice, very subtle. And when it will dry, it will be a bit of a darker color than what we have right now. And at least, is there any way for you to put sound on your camera so that we can hear you a little bit better? Oh, um, not really, but I'm gonna try just to move my computer closer and then we'll use just the audio from it. Here, is this better? Can you hear me better? Yeah, I think that's much better. Okay, perfect. So you're using Ikea brushes yeah. <laughs> and your palette is just kind of wherever you can find um, at that at most little stores. Yeah, exactly. So these one, this one is from um, like an art store, but I have brushes from everywhere. I like trying out different little brushes to see kind of how good they are, how bad they are. It doesn't really matter. I think as long as you're having fun with it, it's going to be good. This one's also an Ikea one. So this one is the bacon powder one, the blueberry ink with bacon powder. I really like it. I think it looks really cool. <laughs> is it like a deep purple? It looks almost like grayish, very, very dark. Yeah, so before it dries, it looks really gray, but from previous encounter with it, I think it will be just like a deep, deep gray purple. I don't know how to explain it. I think that's kind of like the best of it, but I also added quite a lot of baking powder to it. Um, I would recommend to put a lot less than what I put in there and see if you can pay, play with the variation of the color. Um, if you don't want to like sacrifice jars for it and just use these guys, you can just take like a little palette or whatever you have at home, dump a little bit of the original guy and then play with the consistencies of like with lemon juice or baking powder in the palette itself. So you'll be able to kind of see the variations on paper afterwards and see which one you like more. And then if you do want to scale it up and have a full jar of the pigment with the pH variety, then, then just go from what you put in the palette and just increase that. Um, so does the middle, the, the jar in the middle, that's the, your original batch. Does that have any vinegar in it? Yes, of course, yeah. So. We added the vinegar to the pot itself, right? So the original one and the smaller guys, they all have vinegar and they all have salt because we put that in the pot over, over on our stove. Yeah. And that helps the, keep the pigment um, secure. If, exactly. if you... Yes. Um, so just to read it again, so we're using baking soda, right? Yeah, I was using baking soda on this little guy. So this color came out from the baking soda and blueberry. And then this guy right here is the blueberries with lemon juice. And I squeezed about 
half of a lemon in here because I want it to be really bright. And then these guys are from the original one with just vinegar and just salt. Um, so these are now for a little bit more of an art edsy question. Um, what kind of resources or advice would you have for people that are just getting into painting or don't really uh, feel comfortable with calling themselves artists yet? I think what I love about your own artistic style is that it's so accessible and that uh, it really feels like like you, like you can do it, you know? Mm -hmm. um... So if you're already picking up a brush or you're taking a little pencil crayon or whatever, you're already an artist. <laughs> you already, you've already done it. You're, you're there. Um, so I don't really think that you have to like struggle with the title itself of being an artist or not being an artist. Because if you're making art, you're a creative person. You're doing it. You're already there. Um, I also think that if you're struggling with accessibility or anything like that. Again, I started using, like in my own creative journey, I used the shittiest acrylics, I used the, the most horrible pencil crayons, but it kind of taught me what I like more and it kind of just develops your own style and you can figure out which ones do you like more or which one you do you like less and just experiment with it. I think it's really fun to just kind of figure it out on your own, especially now that we're in quarantine and we can basically explore everything that we want and we don't have to be extremely productive all the time um this is just a great time to kind of be alive and just do whatever you can and just have fun with it like this guy uh, any examples that you have in this sketchbook that you can show us the ways that you've pushed the medium yeah so um this one is more of my pencil crayon bit sketchbook uh, i don't know if you can really see it it's kind of like bad quality Let's see if I can just lift it and you'll see better. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's much better. So, so like right. just doing with my regular pencil crayons, just a few sketches. Before I put anything um, onto like the final paper, because I do have finer paper that I buy for my like last project and my last product, I do sketch out like thousands and thousands of compositions. These are all the colors that I use. <laughs> uh, the pencil crayons, right? Yes, the pencil crayons. So like these are my Prisma colors, Premier. So they are like a little bit more finer and oily. These guys are the scholar ones that I got. Yeah, I think our sound cut off again. Um, yeah, I think uh, back just a little um, backtrack to the scholar uh, scholar Prisma colors. I actually also use those. I got them at the pharma pr pharmacy, at, like too to be specific. So they're quite easily to access. They're great, well pigmented. I find. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're very, very nice. I really like the color variety that I had in there. Um, I never used any colors like these before. Like they're super bright. These, this is not my color palette whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, yeah like I really enjoy this like look how fun this is oh my god uh, so have you combined the medium using pencil crayons and watercolor do you have any suggestions um, I don't know if I have an example over here I don't think I have it here but I have been on watercolor paper just because I want to make sure that they're secure and like they're, they don't bleed out or the paper doesn't ruffle out. Um, so I did use watercolor. I don't have any examples because I packed my life away a couple days ago, <laughs> moving from Montreal to Winnipeg. Um, so I have some examples, but I'll be able maybe to share them a little bit later if I just look on my phone and I'll put it as a resource. Yeah, we but can I have share that on social media or in our emails list after. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll do that. But it's really fun. I've been using these guys and the pigments that I made um, from Israel. I made them as well and I use them with colored pencils. And it's such a great little ditty to try out because it does have such a great, you can do like a little background and then add more details with the colored pencils. And I just find it really fun. It's just really so neat. Um, is there an order in which you would use the materials? I, I, 
I know from my own experience that if you use your pencil crayon on a wet surface, it'll rip. Um, but I'm wondering what your own um, experience tells you here. Um, I've been using a background first with a watercolor. So like something like this is what I'm doing right now. And then um, my colored pencils are upstairs, so I won't bother bringing them. But then I'll, I'll make my background and everything like that that I'm planning out. I plan out the whole surface beforehand. And then I use my uh, color pencils on top of that. I do let it dry because, yeah, if you use it on wet, it will rip, which will be very sad. <laughs> so I would recommend to, like, wait, let it dry, maybe work on a few multiple ones. That's how I usually do it. I usually work on multiple drawings at the same time. And if I am using watercolors or the inks that I've made, um, then I wait for them to dry out, and then I use the color pencils on top. So how long would you let um, your paper dry before you were to start uh, with um, color pencils? So probably about five to 10 minutes. You also see them that they're dry. Okay, so it doesn't take very long at all. No, not at all, no. It's not like oil paints that take hours and hours and days and days for them to dry out. They honestly dry out so quickly. This paper, I am moving really fast through the sketchbook itself just because I want to show you the color variations and how nice it is to actually use this and what's the final product. But um, yeah, I usually let it dry for a couple of minutes. Do you think you'd be able to use these uh, watercolors as is on fabric or on canvas, whether that's primed or unprimed? Do you think? Ooh, um, I think maybe not on canvas because you'll have to use a lot of uh, layers on top because um, you want it to be really like a really bright color, right? Um, so you'll have to do a lot of layers. I think canvas, uh, if it's primed, it won't catch it very much. And if it's unprimed, Oh, we cut off again. Uh, so if it's unprimed, I'm assuming the color might fall off a little bit. And, and the color is really nice. And we just need to get really used to making that with silk because it's really hard. Silk is really hard, guys, and also very expensive. <laughs> um, so what type, type of... Um, of watercolor paper weight, um, have you found works best with natural dyes? Mm. Oh man, um, I cannot tell you because I don't know. Mm. Or what's your favorite um, medium to use it on surface, I mean? and watercolor uh, pads are really nice and I find that they don't buckle at all. Um, so Canton watercolor pads, uh, you'd suggest, you recommend for watercolor in general? Yeah. And Have you ever tried handmade paper or um, handmade paper that's store-bought, say from uh, Saint, Th I'm gonna say Saint Ambroise, but I'm pretty sure that's wrong. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah, yeah, I know exactly what yeah. you mean, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is actually very fun. I enjoy that paper so much. It works so well with it. And, oh, they're so vibrant on it. So, yes, use it, use it. <laughs> is there any additional questions? Uh, it's looking like... Uh, we have no more questions. If you are listening right now and you have any uh, anything else you'd like to know, um, please let me know in the Q&A uh, section on the Zoom chat or in the Facebook comments. Okay, so I think we can safely move on to sifting the pigment from its spot. Uh, can we switch to cameras? Yeah. So it's been like couple minutes, I guess 15 minutes or so, um, since it's been uh, just um, cooling down. Oh my god, I can't remember my words at all. Um, so because I, I don't want to move away for the sink and have my back to you guys, I'm just going to move the camera a little bit closer. And like this. I'm just going to put some paper, make sure that I'm not going to spill anything on my mom's kitchen counters. 
if you were to spill anything on your kitchen counters, would that be the worst thing? God, no, I just don't want to clean out too much. <laughs> <laughs> so I do it really slowly. Like I put a little bit in and I let it go through and use your fork to really get all the liquids into your jar. Especially because like the opening of the jar is not really big. So you do have to do it in like batches. But as you can see, it's filling up, you know, it's, you know, it's looking very nicely. Does that take a lot of precision? No. <laughs> so I, I spill it everywhere. It's okay. It's totally fine, you guys. This is a fun experiment. Please don't feel that you need to be some sort of mad genius or scientist to do this. And what do you do with the skins and I guess the pulp that's left over? Do you compost that? Is there any other use for it? I compost it. Um, we have a little garden outside, so we probably use it for the compost and leave it in there until it's ready to use. Um, if you don't have compost, it is organic matter, so maybe save it up. Um, no, it has vinegar in it. Sorry, I was about to suggest make a cake with it. Don't do that. Yeah. That's something that I was thinking because um, I, I often make oat milk and that's something that, you know, you'll use the oat pulp to make cookies or banana bread with or a variety of other things. But um, the blueberry skins left over are soaked with vinegar, so I wouldn't recommend cooking with them. No, please don't. Almost done. Things look like a little bit more rough, and we're good. So, um, if you want the pigment to be finer and you don't want to have any clumps from the seeds or the skins, then you can do this process twice. But you don't have to. If you want the grain, if you want it to be like really nice with the grain itself, because I think it's a cool really effect, you don't have to. Just let it be. In an effort to preserve the skins, if we really want to go full zero waste, which would be a good goal here, um, what if you filtered out the skins and then added the vinegar and salt? You could. I've seen some people do that for sure. You can definitely just add the it. vinegar after. Um, if you want to add it after, that's totally fine. That's up to you. You can definitely just kind of put the pigment in, uh, leave the skins aside for you to cook with or use whatever you want with it and then add the vinegar and the bit of salt, that's totally fine, that's up to you. So doing it this way wouldn't necessarily change the integrity of the dye? No, not at all. That is great, to, good to know. Yeah. Thanks for asking that, I actually forgot about that completely, but yeah. Yeah, that's uh, another credit to Ari and Wee, coming out with the good question. It's really gross, <laughs> it's all over my hands. Making us think. Um, so have some, paper towels or a towel that you don't care about to sacrifice it for the gods of blueberries because it will not come out from your clothes, I've learned in a hard way. Uh, what if we blended the mixture? Um, you, no, please don't. <laughs> It'll be like a smoothie. You won't be able to use it as watercolor anymore. No, so like having the um, the skins and the seeds just mix blended up wouldn't necessarily add to the dye. It would just no. become a painting obstacle. Exactly, it will just become like a smoothie almost. You won't be able to use it since since we're using this as an ink or as a watercolor. You want it to be watery. You still want to have the consistency of water in it. But if you add the skins and the grain into it, it will just be an unusable smoothie. So here is my jar. I'm not going to sift twice through it because I do like the green. And from the, um, the pot that we used and the water that I used to cover it, that's all that came out. Um, mostly because I also have some spillage over here, but that's okay. Again, we're not trying to be very precise in here. Um, and now you can either divide it to like a few jars. I'm like scratching for just a moment. Um, you can either Divide it to a few more jars if you want to play with the pH and you want to add your lemon juice or your baking soda. 
if you want to play around with that, that's totally fine. Or if you just want to keep it as the one color, it's just the blueberry, just leave it be. If later in like a week or two, you decide that you do want to play around with the pH, you can still do it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, thanks so much, Lisa. Do you have any uh, last tips or suggestions for those following along at home today, learning how to create their own pigments for the very first time? Just have fun with it. Like this is a very easy prop, uh, like an easy project to do. It doesn't require much. You can use blueberries, you can use blackberries, whatever you have at home. I said in the beginning of the video, I saw somebody using artichoke hearts or dried rose leaves. Um, you can do whatever. Yes, yeah, so the possibilities are really endless for the um, type of um, substance, I guess, we'd like to use to make natural dyes. Um, thank you very much, Lisa, for opening our minds and our hearts and our sketchbooks to this wonderful process and to raising our awareness of sustainable art practices. It's been great to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for your time and expertise. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Or uh Stay safe. <laughs> if you want to share uh, some of your results with us and your drawings, uh, you can tag me at Lisa Isakoff Art or tag uh, Pork Face, and I'll just see it as well. I would like, I would love to see your results. That'd be really fun. Um, and yeah, stay safe. Thank you so much for joining us. So all of this uh, information will be available um, uh, on the Facebook event page or in a follow-up email that we'll send out. Um, Thank you so much to our audience for watching today and engaging with us. Um, you posed some really interesting questions that really made us think. Um, right, so any further questions can be sent to our email, info.4, uh, the number four, at concordia.ca. As mentioned at the beginning of this workshop, this was just one of our many events offered by both, both Force Space and the larger Concordia community to keep us all active and engaged during this period of distancing. Um, we have a lot of excellent programming coming up, so please follow hashtag see you at home across social media, as well as uh, see you fourth space, specifically on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and keep tabs on our website, uh, concordia.ca slash fourth space, to stay up to date on all the great content coming your way in the next days and weeks. Uh, once again, on behalf of fourth space, thank you for everyone for joining us today, and until next time.